but we do need to get started if we want to get through this particular section well and quickly. So if you guys want to make your way here that want to participate in our time together this morning, we're going to get started uh, with a word of prayer. So I'll just uh, maybe get somebody, if you're in the back, uh, oh, we're okay, the door's going to be open, people are just coming in, it's no problem. So let me go ahead and start us with prayer and uh, we'll get started. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of uh, being here together, Lord, we humble ourselves before you and we give you praise that you have given us the opportunity to be uh, connected through the Holy Spirit of promise, the guarantee of our redemption until we get into your presence. Thank you that you have, uh, Lord, put us on this journey of uh, seeking your face and of moving towards a better country, a city not made with hands. And Lord, we look forward to that day. There, there is just so much in this world that is that as we grow in you, we see is so different than what you would call us to. Uh, there is so much wickedness, Lord, and there's so much disdain even for things that are good and right and holy. And we just want to give you praise that you have shown us a better way, that you have rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of your beloved son and we just want to confess this morning that we look forward to the day oh lord jesus when we can see your face uh, what a day that will be lord we are so grateful for that hope and that joy but for a while we remain we ask that you would help us to be faithful uh, especially in this place that you have created a church and in this little local expression of your body Father, we pray that you would help us to reflect your image in all that we do. Uh, Lord, that we might be able to hand to another generation, should you tarry, uh, Lord, something which is intact and is faithful and can be used in this world to bring hope and strength to your people as well as those who need Christ. Thank you, Lord. Please bless our time. Help me as I teach this morning, and I pray that you'd also prepare our hearts for our time of worship after this, Lord, uh, that you would begin to work in the hearts of those, uh, Lord, that will be coming. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would nag those, that you would convict those, that you would stir those that have been putting off coming to, uh, to church, Lord, here or in some other faithful place in our city. Uh, Lord, uh, spur them on to get out of bed or leave what they're doing that doesn't have eternal consequence and go worship with God's people, Lord. And so we just thank you for this time together, and we pray that you'd be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So obviously we're on our continued journey of church polity. And as we normally do, or have done it the last few weeks, is we're gonna, I'm just going to try to answer a couple questions that have come in um, through the email. Uh, or you can text a question as well. So just an encouragement for you as well to uh, raise questions as you have them. Um, go at, like just make make a note of it, think through it, and then email it to us or text us. That would be really helpful because it gives us a chance to kind of uh, read through and think about what what we have said uh, in order to bring some clarification. And I do want to try to be a little bit more clear on the membership stuff. The question I tried to answer last week, I would like to understand why it would be important for anyone to become a member. Is it not submitting yourself under the authority of the church? Also, how does membership impact church discipline? Do non-members go through the same process? I spoke a little bit about this last week, and um, I had a friend just say, hey, it would be really helpful if you just maybe made like a, you know, member, non-member kind of scenario. And so um, uh, these aren't necessarily just, uh, you know, complete, but these are some of the main things that I've brought up or considered uh, in this that would be helpful. Uh, the first thing for membership is the vote. Uh, here in the church, and I, I, I just, I can't underscore how important that is, really, um, that in our particular context, as a community, outside of the legal, this is the way that we actually, you know, providing a, a, a voting opportunity for people to vote, to raise their voice, uh, is just a, an opportunity for you to really have influence in this community. If you're not a member, you can't vote uh, on things as far as direction, um, you know, not just, you know, what the budget says, but where will this church go and what will this church do uh, beyond the normal things that we are doing just as a community of believers? So this is, 
terribly important. Also, uh, uh, if you are a Christian member, obviously we're, we're assuming that everybody who's a member is a Christian. We go through this process and we try to, uh, there's, a, there's a class with a couple elders and they go through and they, uh, we, we really enjoy actually that time of interaction uh, with God's people. But it does let us see whether or not those that are trying to join our body uh, have uh, a profession of faith that seems reasonable and we can actually say, okay, well, uh, let me see if there's fruit and, uh, and identify that. If you're not a member, you, you um, so from that vantage point, um, all the members that we're speaking about, obviously, are Christian. Uh, if you're a member, you can vote. If you're membership, you know, you can serve in a position of leadership, uh, which if you're not a member, you can't serve in a position of leadership. So it seems to me that if God has called you um, to be in a covenant community with God's people, you would want to be in the place where you can best fulfill your gifts and just allow him to determine when and what that might be. So uh, we're you know, almost robbing yourself of an opportunity of serving the Lord with your gifting uh, because you cannot actually uh, serve on the highest levels uh, of responsibility. It doesn't necessarily need to be leadership with a diaconate or eldership, but just leadership over a ministry uh, to be concerned over a few people that God has given you. There's also legal identification with Westwood. Um, this is important because it does provide an opportunity to have, um, on paper, covenant community, okay? And this is just the way our culture works. I know that there's a pretty vast array of perspectives with respect to church membership in the Christian community. Uh, but legal identification with Westwood uh, is, I think, super important because it, it uh, I think it helps us um, just be more committed. So when things get hard, you're not just like, well, you know, I'm just going to move on. It's like, no, I, this is, these are my people. Like, I want this thing to work well. And I'm going to put myself in a place where I can have as much influence for that betterment than, uh, than other places. Uh, if you remember, you're expected to serve in any ministry where gifting and needing match. Okay, so uh, if you're not a member, there's limited service. Uh, pastoral care, we do try our best to, to care for everyone that comes to the church, okay? That's just, you're God's people. If you're a member or not, you're walking with the Lord. If you don't know the Lord and you're in, a, you know, you find yourself in the church, we, we want those points of contact so that maybe we can share the gospel in such a way that the Lord would illumine your eyes and you could see the beauty of Christ. And that's kind of the, the goal there. So we want to give pastoral care to everybody. But in those moments where we don't, you know, where we don't have a clear uh, you know, who's a member, who's not, or things are getting really busy, um, our focus is going to be primarily on those who have identified with this body uh, instead of trying to chase people down that uh, aren't necessarily committed, but they're just kind of touching base with the church. Uh, trials and needs, and this gets to what I said before, uh, if you're a member, we expect you to walk with us kind of like a family, okay? Thick and thin, um, not just walking away. There's just no, if you're not a member, it's like, okay, well, we'll, uh, you know, I don't have to be here. I'll just move on when I want to. That's not the kind of relationships that God desires in a church community. He wants a depth there. Um, and then also expected to use resources to advance the ministry. Let's buy in. You know, this is my home. I'm going to use the gifts and abilities that God has given me to, to, to advance I can't tell you how much money we have saved by a few people in our congregation uh, that have just, I don't want to say their names, they're here, many of them, uh, but have just spent a lot of time fixing holes and running wires and repairing things in the church. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money over the last <laughs> decade. Uh, that the Lord has uh, allowed us to save because of the gifting and the desire to serve the community of believers here. And that's such a blessing. So there, I, I don't want to, when I say expected to use resources, I'm not just talking about dough. I'm talking about what, what do you have that, that we need, you know, this ability to be able to just um, work and help us get to another place. So that, you know, those, that's just a little slide, like a contrast, member, non-member. 
and what we expect, what we're hoping for. Uh, and that kind of would be a tag to some of the things that I mentioned earlier uh, with respect to membership. So even though I'm saying that we're all members of the body of Christ and there's a responsibility to one another because we're members and that's a big deal. I'm also saying that you can't be a member, an effective member and a, com and a communal member like God intends in the scriptures to every church in this community. You have to be somewhere. And if you're going to be somewhere, uh, are you going to put yourself in a place where you are most committed uh, or most able to be able to serve that church in a way that's helpful? Okay, so everybody kind of on the same page there? I've got the Sunday morning looks from everybody. It's like we're kind of awake. The coffee hasn't hit yet. You know, nobody's wiggling yet as far as needing to go to the bathroom. That's probably happened later. But let me go to another one. Um, here's another question we had. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 seems to be saying that the role of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers is to equip all the saints to do the work of the church or to equip them for the work of service, Aragon, Diakonia. I think there's a common perception in our culture that staff elders, deacons do most of the work with the exception of those who truly understand what God has called them to. And typically the ratio falls in line with the 80-20 rule, 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. Let me just pause there for a second. Anybody ever seen Everybody Loves Raymond? Okay. There's a great section in there where there's a question about theology and they're having an argument. And uh, one of the folks says, well, let's just go ask, I think it's a Catholic family, let's go ask Father so-and-so. And they're like, well, we can't do that. It's not Sunday, you know, it's illegal. And, and Raymond's like, why do you think we put money in that thing that goes past every time? I mean, this is, we gotta get these answers, you know? There's this almost this expectation. It was like, you guys, you just gotta handle that and, you know, uh, you're our Google, Dr. Google, when we have a question. Uh, that's just a joke, but it's funny. Because even in that context, uh, a Catholic context, you kind of see some of these tensions. Continuing on with the question, how should the average congregate think about their role in this, spe this specific church body, especially if they don't have one of these titles that suggest they've been specifically tasked with an office? What specific tasks should we explicitly ask and encourage members regular committed attendees to be involved in, either from the pulpit or as we consider people to ask to be involved in certain ministries. Should there be a distinction between what we allow official members, regular attendees, not official members, but have proven committed, and newer attendees who, have not, who haven't had time to show commitment to our body to do in our specific, excuse me, our specific church body? I'm thinking specifically about children's ministry, greeters ministry, food ministry, et cetera. And further, what should our community look like overall and what should the expectation be for communicating what our community is doing together, small groups, regular meals, intentional serving, the community together and sharing the gospel, et cetera. Okay, I love this question. Both of them that we've had, they're long, right? But it shows us that people want to see this place thriving. Like, these are questions of how do we make this place more faithful, better. So let me just take this kind of in sections, okay? How should the average congregant think about their role in a specific church body, especially if they don't have one of these titles? that suggests they've been specifically tasked with an office. Somebody want to grab Proverbs 3, 27, and another person, James 4, 17. When you got it, sword drill. And, ah, that's not mine. I remember that from last week. This is good. Proverbs 3, 27, and James 4, 17. When you have it, just jump up and say it, and we'll give you a smiley face. <laughs> Okay, can you say that again, Speedy? <laughs> okay. That was the Proverbs passage? James, that's right. Proverbs 3.27. Okay, so those are both verses that kind of deal effectively with what the Christian community sh should always be looking to do. If I can do something and I'm not doing it and I know I should be doing it, it's a sin. Do not withhold good to those whom prove it is due. And if I know to do right and I don't do it, it's a sin. So if we're thinking about what our role should be in a specific church, the underscore of this is I'm a Christian, I have to serve God's people. I'm a Christian here, which means I'm going to run into needs that are in this family here. So how do I keep my eyes open? And if I don't keep my eyes open for service and I'm not actually serving when the Lord pricks my heart uh, with those that, have, that God's put in my path, then I'm actually not being honorable with my Christian walk. I'm not having integrity. James specifically calls it sin. 
So before we get into any kind of like, what should we do? Remember that at the end of the day, this is a moral issue between you and the Lord and me and the Lord. Am I being faithful with what God's placed before me? Okay. So that's how we should think about our roles in any church body. Like I've got to give account to the Lord with respect to my integrity with God's people here in this place. Uh, what specific task should we explicitly ask and encourage members, regularly committed attendees to be involved in, either from the pulpit as we consider people to ask to be involved in certain ministries? All right, Luke chapter 10, verses 29 through 37. Anybody know what that section is? Good Samaritan, okay? And basically, how do I know who my neighbor is, is the question. So what do I know what my task should be? Well, how do I know who my neighbor is? Well, I'm walking down the street, and ta-da, <laughs> there's this guy that needs help. So how do I help them? So the first thing is, as I've kind of mentioned in my last uh, point in the last slide, the previous slide, what is the need that's before me? That's how explicitly, what's the need that's before me? As opposed to, you know, we got these kinds of things. Now, sometimes the need is, and we found this especially with children's ministry, um, People just get sick. I mean, when you got little kids, they're like walking petri dishes of disease, right? I mean, do you guys remember those moments? You're like, you just, they, they start getting that green, you know, column, the, both of them. And you're like, it's just, that kid's been sucking on everything that I'm touching. I'm going to be sick in a day, right? And before you know it, it's Sunday and everybody's puking, everybody's coughing and hacking in your house. And you're not going to come to church to do that. There have been times when, like, our whole teams in certain departments have been wiped out sick. And sometimes we just need somebody to say, hey, here's, <laughs> like, I really wanted to be in the service today, but I, there's, there are parents that I can serve uh, who are dropping kids off just by being in, in, that, uh, in that environment. And so um, that would be one example. Uh, obviously, another example would be... Um, you know, just youth ministry kind of needs and things that are there. Uh, different kinds of opportunities obviously are always rising up. And just to be ready to actually interact with them, I think, is really important. Now, with this question that's raised, I want to add an element which I'm calling humility, uh, which is Matthew 6.3, Ma excuse me. Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, okay? I... As a pastor, one of my concerns is to get up here and be like, oh, we're doing all this stuff in our community and look at so-and-so and that thing, whatever else. That just, there are times when just knowing what God's doing in our body is super encouraging. And there are other times when it's like, hey, look at us. And I, my needle points to the, I don't even want to get close to the look at us thing. So I would rather slowly allow people to find out what's going on. Uh, than to just have it blanketed everywhere and we can get prideful, all right? Let me just give you a couple examples uh, of things that happen all the time that you might not even be aware of. Um, every year we've been doing this, and there are people that are participant in this. We, we did this for a while with all the schools, and now we're focusing specifically on Perry Heights, which is right here. But we would do a breakfast every year, for whatever feeder school was going to end up at Wrights, okay? So the t it would be for the teachers and for the staff. And it was an opportunity to get this entire staff during their prep into our building and say, we, we, have, we just want you to know we're praying for you, and you can have lunch. We're going to give you some pencils and crayons and whatever else you need, which is just, you know, a buck a person kind of thing, uh, cheap stuff. But it's just, a, hey, we're here. We know you're out there. We know you're going to have very difficult needs. And we've done that probably for 14 years. Uh, a lot of people don't even know that that ministry has been happening. Now it's more focused on Perry Heights. Now we just kind of take donuts to them and say, hey, a couple times a year we're here. Let us know. They use our building uh, however we need. I came to the office several years ago one day. And apparently one of the guys that mows the lawn next door at the nursing home uh, I don't know if it's the same crew that's doing it now, but when, in this particular time, it was this crew. This guy was in a hurry. You know, they're, they got, probably have three or four other jobs to go to. He's zipping along and runs into something. Boom. And there's a lady just kind of clicking away, you know, like, okay, well, that was weird. And she looks out, and this guy's actually parking his thing, and she smells gas. <laughs> 
the dude hit the gas line that went into the house and is like, oh, snap, <laughs> let me just get out of here before this thing goes pluey. Uh, or at least we're assuming that was, I mean, I can't imagine why he would want to leave that quickly unless he was like, I got to get out of here. Well, I didn't know anything about that until I came here and our entire building is full of residents from the nursing home. I mean, it was like they're in the foyer, they're all over the place right here, uh, they're in the fellowship hall. I'm like, what just happened? <laughs> you know, like, ah. And you know me, I'm Mr. Disinfectant Guy, so I'm like, ah, my hazmat suit, I left it in my office, where do I go? You know? Anyway, I just, I raise that to say, guys, there, there's a lot of ministry happening that we don't know about uh, as a public church, you know, like everybody. And, and sometimes it's because there are some ministries that are very um, specialized. And I, I know you guys know about the 414 Collective, and it's serving the, the folks that are in the sex industry, um, which many of them are sex trafficked. You know, we will hear about that occasionally. We're actually going to get a testimony about that before long. Uh, but we want to be very careful, because what happens if, as we hope would happen, some of those folks that are being reached actually start coming to Westwood? And we have this little like, hey, look at us, we're over here, you know, we're handing out lollipops to prostitutes, yay. Like, talk about demeaning, right? It's like you go from one demeaning situation to another, you're just being used. So we're trying to be very careful for the pride's sake and also for folks that come with respect to ministry needs in this body. This, can, this church body is connected all over the city, let me just tell you that. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Like, for instance, with the women's ministries that are in this city, uh, the battered shelters and stuff, if you are capable of that, or the mustard seed that's downtown, uh, it's not called mustard seed, um, uh, the shelters downtown, uh, people are connected into these things. It doesn't have to say Westwood on it for us to be faithful as a community of believers. So we're going to focus on a few things that we can do well. And if other churches are doing it well, or communities of believers are doing it well in our city, we're going to say, if that's your gifting, go help them you know, and bring back the energy and the joy of being faithful there. But humility needs to underscore all of this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 3, 33, Ephesians 5, 19, and 1 Corinthians 12, 27 are explicit commands to use our gifts, okay? So if I sit down with you and say, what is your natural inclination that the Holy Spirit wants to fill for service in the kingdom of God? You should be able to say, well, these three things I seem to want to enjoy or I'm still developing. Great. How do we get you plugged in? Most of the time, we're not that objective. We're just kind of like, man, life is busy. Life is crazy. I'm not sure what my gifts are because they're not those over there. And we miss it. Uh, so just be faithful with the opportunities God has given you, number one, to serve in a way that God has given you the capacity to serve. Uh, and, and, and then... Just go from there to see what God does. Let me just give you one illustration to help you kind of determine what your gifting, gifting uh, would be in a particular situation and to not diminish yourself because it's not someone else's expression, okay? So let's just say you walk into a room that you know needs to be used for another ministry. It's Sunday morning. You walk in. The place is trashed, and you know you got 20 people coming in there. And in the middle of that room, you see this person crying in the corner. There's going to be two responses, okay? Both responses will see the room is messed up. But determining your gifts, or in, your gifts will be determined based upon how you respond to the situation. Some people immediately will not see any of the mess. All they see is the ugly cry going on in the corner, and it's like, oh, i got to go help this person. That's a gift from the Lord to go. Like, there's this movement. And then the other person's like, how do we get this person out of here to someone who can help them? So we can get this room clean and get these other people to come in here, right? Like people are laughing because it's like, this is probably husband and wife situations every day. Like, ah, these tensions. But just looking at your, at your particular gift sets and those kinds of scenarios, how do you respond will determine a lot of how you actually are gifted by the Lord. Let me give you an example. We'll go back to the Old Testament with Saul. Saul, really tall guy, good looking. Everybody thinks that he's going to be the BMOC, and the Lord ends up making him a king, obviously, right? And here's what's fascinating about this story. He was super scared all the time. 
right? He didn't want to be in the limelight. Even after his first anointing, uh, he's hiding behind all this stuff that everybody, like the baggage it's called, the luggage. So everybody shows up to this particular area and Paul is hiding, all right? They have to bring him out and anoint him. But it says that after that anointing, what happened was when he turned away, I think this, this one or the one time with, with the first anointing, that the Lord gave him a new heart. Now, we see that new heart when he hears about Israel being attacked by a uh, surrounding country, and they took captives, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon Saul. And he blows a trumpet and calls everybody out, and people follow him because the Lord had put fear in their lives to actually follow Paul or to follow Saul. Okay, here's a guy who, you know, to use the Tennessee term, wouldn't say sue if a sow was eating him, right? So you're not making any noise, I'm hiding. And in a moment, because the Lord's gifting, when the opportunity came, he moves. Okay, so what are you, what are you all of a sudden inclined to uh, by virtue of what's before you? That gets to the need component, okay, of Luke chapter 10, verse 29. So explicitly, use your gifts. I don't know what your gifts are, but then keep an eye open for, you know, I could probably serve in the nursery today even though I don't want to because everybody's sick. How do I make myself available for that? Um, should there be a distinction between what we allow official members, regular attendees to do, uh, newer attendees who haven't had time to show commitment to our body um, in our specific church? I'm thinking specifically about children's ministry, Gibeah's ministry, food ministry, et cetera. The answer is yes, there is a distinction. We saw that from, from before. But I, I, I've got on here, this isn't a lab. The body is diverse. Life is crazy and commitment is not the same for church as for other parts of life, uh, which is what we found as well in particular ministries. So, you know, if, if church is optional, if church is kind of a Sunday morning, you know, this is part of what I do, but it's not everything that I do, then you're going to see people come in and out of those engagements without any need to call and say, hey, we're sick. And that has happened. I got to tell you that part of the reason sometimes we see holes in our ministry is because people are just displaying a natural inclination not to be committed. We are a culture of no contracts, okay? And I don't have to tell anybody because I'm just doing my own thing. And if they don't like it, well, I'll just go somewhere else. Uh, you know what? That's going to show up in the church. And part of our responsibility as a body, especially as elders, is to help people through that deficiency that our culture has innately brought up in their hearts and minds. Which means that sometimes we're going to hurt. Uh, sometimes Dave's going to walk in and not have a hazmat suit, <laughs> you know, and that's good uh, for us to be serving. Now, one thing we do do, and we're trying to move to a healthy model, for instance, if people are in a vulnerable sector or serving in a vulnerable sector, we want everybody to have background checks that are serving vulnerable sectors uh, in our community here. Um, just we're, there's, there's so much behind the scenes that we're trying to do just to protect the church in this particular culture that we're in that's absolutely crazy in so many different ways that, you know, they would rob the church on a Sunday morning of an opportunity just to worship if we brought all this stuff up. That's part of the leadership responsibility and, uh, and to know uh, when we have to bring things before the church community, a business community, like the church business meetings uh, in order to help us be more faithful in our community. Uh, but just to know that uh, we are, tr we are reaching for excellence in the midst of a culture that does what it wants to do, okay? And we have to shepherd people through that. Uh, that's kind of our goal. All right. And to that, I underscore this. Church is not a business. It's a family. How diverse is any one family on any issue, right? Uh, you just, you sit your kids down, and you've got the gamut of personalities. At least that's how it's in, in, our, in our life. And I grew up with six, uh, six siblings, uh, five siblings. I'm five of I'm number five of six, and every single one of us is different, um, except for the fact that we're all Spanish and we get angry the same way, which is <laughs> never healthy. Uh, I always wonder how our neighbors even survived all the crazy from us. So, uh, church is not a business; it's a hospital and a rehab facility of the soul. There will always be very levels of Christian maturity and unsaved people who seem to have fruit. So this is actually really an important point when we're answering this question. And the reason I raise it as an important point is we can get really sideways for the church over how someone actually acted towards us. 
And what we might miss completely is that they aren't even believers. And everybody thought they were until this one moment. Okay? Uh, that's just the reality of sojourning to a better country. Uh, where Jesus says that there are, there are weeds that have been sown in amongst the wheat. And we have to remember those things as we're thinking about our responsibility as a church and our function together in a church community, okay? And then church is not a business, it's our identity, which I think is really important because uh, we can be very clinical sometimes with church or with business, and, 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 and we don't realize that um, we're actually part of the body, okay? Uh, we might be a hand, we might be a foot, we might be a leg, we might be an eye. You don't deal with the body the same way you do with a business structure. There's a business side of church, which we try to manage in a way that's honorable before the Lord. But we have to use biblical language to describe what we actually are. Uh, so sheep, a flock, being led along, being encouraged, being rebuked, being strengthened, being healed, uh, allowing the expression of God's people in a, in, in a way where they continue to mature. All these different kinds of things are playing in on any given Sunday. Like I, the conversations that I have with people throughout the week and on Sunday are from point A to Z, Z if you're from Canada, okay? It, it's fascinating. Now, you can't enter into all of those, and nor should you. But what I'm trying to help you see is the breadth of things not only that are happening, but the breadth of personalities and the breadth of need and the breadth of community that we have in this little body here on the west side on this little hill that thankfully made it through that storm. First thing I did when I got here was like, is the, is the after Friday, because we had terrible winds, is the missile still on the building? You know, I call it the missile. And we had terrible winds up here, you know. Uh, and yet the power was out, but everything seems to be in order. All right. Those are the questions. If you have any more questions, write them down. I'll try to answer them next week. Uh, obviously questions that pertain to our discussion. If you have other questions that pertain to the ministry, I'll answer them personally uh, or have some of the staff maybe answer them with the elders. But let me just review really quickly where we've been. Uh, last week we took a minute to just talk about how we actually work through Scripture because we're going to spend some time doing some exegesis. Or we did last week. Remember we spent, uh, we, did, we did a word study on, on the use of, of diakonos uh, in the New Testament. And uh, what we, what I tried to share with you was that when we begin with a text and we're trying to exegete it correctly, that is bring out what the text says, what's in there, we spent some time looking at the actual text itself, okay? This stupid thing is already freaking out on me. Let me just, uh, let me come back to it. Sorry, guys. These updates are horrible because then nothing talks to itself. And uh, then you get a guy like me who's not Mr. Techie. Uh, slideshow. Some current. It was working a minute ago, and then it just went sideways on me. All right, here we are. Let's try this. So, <laughs> it's not doing it. <laughs> Spanish anger, you know. Where's the hammer? Clink, it's done. All right. We're, st we're, <laughs> we're starting with the text. We look at the text, what's being communicated in the text. And then from that... We want to look at how the author is using that particular con that concept or word in his book, okay? Uh, we want to know how they're, how they're actually thinking through these particular paradigms. And then we want to see how the Bible informs all of that on any particular issue. Uh, now, there are times when we can do a word study like we did last week, which we were starting from the Bible point of view and we're working back towards the text. Uh, we, we want to do that to kind of get the, the weight of Scripture and what, what it's communicating. But that's really the work of exegesis. And this is really the foundation of what we understand and underscore with respect to uh, sola scriptura, okay? The, that principle of the scriptures are my final authority on all things. It doesn't mean we're not looking at other things to help us understand how to better communicate what's being communicated here, uh, if we're teaching it in my uh, vantage point, or to understand what the author's communicating to us, how we're understanding what they're given, or use tools where people are, you know, Greek and Hebrew gurus and Aramaic gurus. Uh, I use the tools that I have to understand what those guys are talking about. Okay, so I'm, I'm almost like a family practice guy. Uh, when they get a report, I'm like, oh, wow. 
I know that's a big deal. You need to go talk to that guy that does this. <laughs> but I can just point you in the right direction. Okay, so that's, that's me and how I function with some. And there are some brilliant, brilliant people that God has called to do specific kinds of work to help us understand what's there. But as a Christian, and the mercy of the Lord is that the, the scriptures are tangible to us. We can read them. We can understand them. God has put you in a country where you can find literacy. And if you have trouble reading, which is not uncommon for people with different kinds of disabilities, there are a plethora of book or Bible trans, uh, translations that are audio, and you can listen to it and, and catch it. So it's, it's amazing how much the Lord has provided for us to understand exactly what the scriptures are saying. And then we can spend some time looking at how the church in the past, the historical view in the past, how that has actually influenced. So, so how are God's people who, are, who were struggling with this particular section of scripture, how were they talking about this way back when? Okay, how did the church display the consequence of their exegesis on a particular section? And we can also spend some time looking at commentaries, which I have here, like these are not inspired, they're helpful, but they're not inspired. And so we take that with a grain of salt. Like here's a Christian person who's saying, I'm using the tools that I have to go through this text, but they might have influences in their life that lead them away from conclusions that are necessary for any given, any given text. So we take the views of other Christians uh, into consideration, and, uh, and yet we also, first of all, spend time looking at the Bible book text. Now, in situations where we know someone's further along with us, our responsibility as a Christian is what? If I don't know everything about this particular text that will help me inform, help inform me with respect to the decision that I need to make, I will walk in the wake of someone I can trust until I am mature enough to really dive into this text. It's what families do. It's what kids do, right? You're with mom and dad, and at some, at some point, kids are going to have their own families, and they're going to look a little bit different than your family, because they're making decisions that are different based upon their own understanding of life. This is not too dissimilar from what we can do as Christians as we make decisions on any given topic, and obviously, we're talking about leadership this morning with respect to the diaconate. Can we have deacons and deaconesses? Can, can, there, can women and men serve in this particular uh, office? that seems to be created, obviously, in Scripture. So, let's remember one thing that is important. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. The Bible will not contradict itself. So as you're doing your exegesis, you find the harmony. And you stay humble. Don't inform the text what you want it to say. And that's always the struggle with every one of us. Okay, now, our focus this morning on this diaconate component is to look at the primary text. Last week, we looked at the scope of Scripture. This week, the primary text, Acts chapter 6, the first deacons were actually put into place. All right? And what we remember about Acts chapter 6 was that there was a need in the Greek-speaking community. Those are the Hellenists. Uh, so people are coming to faith in Jerusalem. They're there. You know, 3,000 people come to faith after Peter preaches a message, which was phenomenal. But they're from all parts of the Roman Empire, they just happen to be Jews that are now in Jerusalem, but their primary language was not the Hebrew or Aramaic language, I should say. Okay, so it would be like me, I'm in Canada, speaking Spanish at home, and everything else around me is, uh, is English. Well, what happens if, like many, the Lord just didn't let the Spanish stick and I go back to Spain for something? I'm like false advertisement, right? I'm like, hey, I don't know what you guys are talking about, man, <laughs> right? I'm Spanish, but I'm not communicating. And so there was some struggles with, uh, when there was need in the church, there were struggles with respect to how these people that were kind of outsiders but weren't were being treated, right? So, uh, and it was with the distribution of food, because obviously there was need there. They were getting cut out of society. And these six men, I think, no, uh, how many was it? I'm thinking to the city that's right here. I think it was six, seven, thank you. Seven guys uh, were selected, and one thing that's interesting that the church did was that they selected people that could interact in both contexts. So all of these guys had Greek names. They were Jews with Greek names. Uh, they were Hellenists. They understood the culture, and they served the church. So the church is thinking not just the people that are qualified spiritually, but their, their external gift sets. Can these people kind of interact with both of us? So that's one of the primary texts because we see what they did there at the beginning uh, in selecting seven men 
to serve the community of believers, which has directed the influence of many churches with respect to should there be deacons and deaconesses. Well, one of the examples in the beginning was that it started with men. And then obviously we have an example towards the end in Romans, for instance, where we have Phoebe. Is she just called a servant or is this actually a title of deaconess that was given to her by the church? And so there's an argument that's naturally coming out of the text that I think is important for us to see so that we don't cut someone off that might have a different view on this particular point than we may have. Okay, so let's just look at the primary text of 1 Timothy, which is really where most of this uh, springs from. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 3.13. I desire then that in every place, okay, I'm starting here, by the way, let me just pause. I'm starting here instead of chapter 3, because remember what we said about the text? The chapter sections are created by us to understand where to find things. They're helpful. But they don't necessarily help us identify where the train of thought should start and stop sometimes, okay? This is where Paul actually transitions to interacting and giving commands uh, for leadership. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 3, 13. I desire then that in every place the men should pray. That's Andre, okay? So uh, some derivative of Andras. And, Andri, I think, is what it is, um, where we get Andres. Um, I sound like my big fat Greek wedding, right? In the Greek, the word is this. <laughs> and in English, it's this. Okay, so, but it's, it is helpful. Uh, the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise, also that women, okay, that's the word gynaikos, or some derivative of. It's a case-sensitive language, and so you're going to have the root, plus if it's accusative or genitive or nominative or all this stuff that we don't want to think about. But it helps, it's, it's very helpful with respect to understanding what's being communicated. Uh, that women should, uh, or we, you know, later on he translates that word wives, or it's translated, I should say, by the translators. Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls of costly attire, but with what is proper for women to pr profess as godliness. Uh, uh, First Peter chapter 3, three uh, communicates the same kind of thing. Uh, let me just underscore here that he's not saying you can't braid your hair. Uh, or, or have gold necessarily. He's talking about this opulence that was uh, being communicated within the worship. And I say that because 1 Peter 3, 3, he includes in the don't do these things, he includes clothing. So he's not telling everybody to walk around naked in church, right? So obviously he's meaning something different than, you know, what's the point? What's, what am I trying to do? So don't, not this look at me sense in church, okay? Uh, verse 11, let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet, for Adam was firm, formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. That's a really hard section. Okay, verses 13 through 15. Really smart people scratch their heads. Okay. But the point I'm trying to communicate is the use of the man and woman in this particular section. Okay, that's what we're trying to see as it continues on. And he goes specifically after this address to men and women and to wives, uh, uh, I guess, uh, or not to wives, just to men and women in general, okay? Um, then we go specifically to elders. This thing is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage the, his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into the snare of the devil, okay? And then he's gonna transition to deacons, which we're gonna get to know. And I'm gonna show my hand here a little bit and just uh, include a, an argument for my view that deaconesses are actually biblical. Um, and that is that there is no instruction here to the elders' wives, which you would expect if we're communicating some instruction to elders' wives or to deacons' wives in this next section. Uh, so it's a bit of an argument from silence. Why would he speak about the deaconesses or not deaconesses, the deacons' wives 
in one section and not speak about the elders' wives in the section immediately preceding it. And that's a question, obviously, that's been put out by faithful people, and I tend to, to lean towards that particular argument. Okay? Uh, deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Okay, now I've underscored this particular word in verse 11 there, uh, and, and um, italicized that because that word is supplied by the translators, okay? And sometimes you have to do that when you're translating. You're trying to communicate something, and you're like, how do I communicate this? If I go down to South America, or if someone from South America, excuse me, I go, I'm translating for somebody in a Spanish context. Let's go that way. And they say in English, it was raining cats and dogs out there. That is not something that translates and communicates in a, in a Hispanic context. They're like, what? The gatos were coming out of the ceiling? You know? <laughs> it just does not work. And so you have to, as someone who's in translating, you have to think about, all right, it was like pouring rain. Okay, we got that. So the translators are trying to determine what to do, verse 11, with the word that's wives, translated wives here, which is the word dinaikos, which is woman or wife. Okay? So now they're making a determination that this word here needs to be translated wife as opposed to what they did in the earlier section in chapter 2, where it was women, 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 nothing with the elders, and now wives. So there's, there's a bit of a shift in their view. Now, it's not necessarily wrong, okay? And, and the church for a long time has held that this is the way it needs to be translated. So we need to be careful not to disparage uh, a view um, that might not align with a view that permiss is permissive to deaconesses, okay? Uh, their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let the deacons each be, and this is one woman man, hus husband of one wife, man of one woman. That's the idea same as in the, uh, in the above section. And some people think, okay, well, if that's the case, he's identifying men because women aren't, you know, like this is a marriage kind of scenario. And we're going to work through that in just a second. Managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Okay. How do we work through this section? Because this is the big section of instruction for men and women leadership. And again, just to underscore that our view, especially with regard to eldership, uh, is that God restricts that particular office to men, not out of capacity, not out of uh, identity as being, you know, women being less than men, but as Paul says, and we'll get into that, Lord willing, next week, uh, a connection point with something that God has been doing since creation, the order of creation. And how in this world we still need to fulfill that order of creation until God takes us to a different world, okay? But for deaconesses, we're trying to determine whether or not uh, this is part of that thinking, okay? So notice the flow of thought. Verse 2, an overseer must be. Verse 8, deacons likewise must be. Verse 11, women could be wives, likewise must be. And then verse 12, men must be able to do something. Uh, the structure seems to point, at least in my view, to the fact that the distinction is not between men and women, but deacons versus elders, okay? Two offices. Verses 8 through 10 and verse 13, it's the deacons, like the office in general. Verse 11, female deacons. Verse 12, male deacons. Uh, is, is what the sense is there. And then obviously the silence in Scripture. Why would deacon wives be addressed and not elders' wives in the section on leadership? Especially since wives and women in the deacon section are held to the same moral qualifications as elders and other deacons, i.e. dignified and sober-minded. And the answer that I am positing is, and the answer that I've borrowed from, from many faithful Christians, is that we're understanding this to be because the instruction for diaconate includes male and female deacons, not just one. So, what do we do when there is a difference of opinion? Okay? Well, and obviously we have grace, we have 
kindness towards one another. Uh, let me just highlight this. The text can be translated as wife, but there is a certain issue that Paul is toggling back and forth between men and women. Right? In the beginning he says women, says nothing about women in, in, in love worship, and now he goes back to wives or the deacons. It doesn't seem to flow necessarily. And here is what we have to do when we come up to issues that are difficult. When there is a question of what to do, we lean on the weight of Scripture, as we saw last week, usages of the word in the New Testament is very broad and inclusive of both genders. Okay, so we're in a section, 1 Timothy chapter 2 through 3, that we're like, you know, the arguments seem reasonable on both sides. It could be that Phoebe was just being communicated as a servant, not necessarily the title of deaconess, okay? It could be that Paul didn't want to talk to, about the elders' wives, and he just wanted to focus on the diaconate wives. That, that's legitimate. It could be that it should be translated not women, but wives in that particular section. Uh, so, so we're being careful, okay? So we're, we're, we're recognizing the potential of that being actually translated that way. How do we know, then, that it's okay to go a different direction? Obviously, the arguments that I presented, but then the weight of Scripture. Remember how I started that there's a harmony in Scripture, not a dissonance. And the weight of Scripture, the weight of the New Testament instruction is uh, that diakonos or diakoni is used broadly in the New Testament to include both male and females in their service of God's people. Uh, that's what we saw last week when we went through all those particular texts. So that being the case, I am leaning, my needle is towards, here's how I see the New Testament instruction, here is what I understand in the argumentation for the deacons, deaconesses, in chapter 2 and chapter 3, I think therefore that women should be included in the diaconate, okay? So that's, that's the thinking, and I think what we're offering here as well is a, is a, is a way to show how to be faithful, to look at the text of scripture and wrestle with it, and also how to be gracious with one another with different views on this particular thing, okay? Um, so, a few more things to consider. Historical presence of deaconesses in the church. This, remember, this goes to our, right here, we did the textual study, Bible book text, and now we're looking as well at historical view of the church and commentaries. Uh, and there's a pretty good leaning of people within the church historically and in commentaries that lean uh, towards deaconesses. And there's a pretty good leaning that goes the other way as well, just historically. So I'm looking at other churches that I trust for other things. Uh, and, you know, Jeff mentioned those last week. The, thing, the people that had gone before that we trust, you know, MacArthur's Church, uh, Nine Marks, which is out in, in D.C., which is a Southern Baptist church, uh, and many Southern Baptist communities are recognizing this uh, as well. Um, and then also uh, R.C. Sproul, the Presbyterian context there, uh, some, of the, some of their churches, but at least their particular church, I think, was favorable to that argumentation that was there. Um, as we can see, for instance, in some of the table talks, or not table talks, some of their advertisement that's on their webpage, ligonierministries.org or ligonier.org. So, so basically what I'm saying is the church isn't in complete agreement on this, uh, but faithful people are on different sides. And as elders, we're asking you to consider uh, kind of following us through this path that where our conviction is that it's on the, on, on the needles pointing towards deaconesses being um, biblically reasonable, Okay. Uh, or, or included. And we also know historically as a church, there were, there were women and extra biblical writings that actually served as deacons and were identified as deacons. Uh, now, could be the church was wrong, could be that they missed it, but we, we want to at least identify that the church in those times uh, was represented in that way. So, underscore again, this is a conversation in the family, if you remember. You can help us decide which way the church is going to go. If you're not a member, you've got to sit and watch. <laughs> okay? Uh, but, uh, and, and, you know, we're still going to continue on and be faithful and love you guys uh, with what God has called us to do. So that is the section on deacons and church policy.
you have any questions, I think it was recorded. I'm not sure it was live streamed uh, this morning because we had trouble. Kind of recorded? Okay, it was kind of recorded. I will make this available, or excuse me, I will give this to somebody who will make this available <laughs> uh, online. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to send those to us. We love you guys. And we're so glad that we've been given the privilege and the opportunity to serve you. And we want to continue to do that. Let me pray. Father, thank you for this time together. I pray, God, that you'd help us to be faithful in our deliberations and in our work. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would be glorified in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys.